Mystery by Eric Newman Chapter 26 26 Paul is on trial before King Agrippa, but Paul turns the tables, giving Agrippa his testimony, verses 4 to 18, and the Gospel, verses 20, 23, which leads to Agrippa being put on trial spiritually, having to answer if he believes the Gospel or not, verses 27 to 28. 26 colon 2 an unbeliever on trial before a king with a potential punishment of death would not be happy however paul is happy because he has an opportunity to share the gospel with a king he is not worried about his own life because for to me to live is christ and to die is gain philippians 1 verse 21 26 colon 3 paul implies that agrippa goes to the jewish synagogue and is familiar with all of their customs Therefore, he is familiar with the Old Testament scriptures. This means that, if Agrippa believes God's word, Paul just needs to show him how Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah. Then, Agrippa will be saved. 26, 4-5 Acts 5 verse 34 says that Gamaliel was a doctor of the Jewish law and had a good reputation among all the Jewish leaders. 22 colon 3 says that Paul was brought up in Jerusalem at the feet of Gamaliel. 22 colon 5 tells us that Paul went on to receive authorization from the Jewish elders to imprison Christians. Therefore, the Jewish religious leaders know Paul well. However, now that he has forsaken Jewish traditions in favor of God's word, they want him dead and will not even admit that he used to be on their side. 26, 6-8 critics of right division will say that Paul must have preached the same gospel as the twelve apostles did, because Paul says that his hope is the same as the hope of his Jewish forefathers. However, Paul defines his hope, not as God's eternal kingdom on earth, which is Israel's hope, but as a more general hope, which is resurrection into God's kingdom. For us today, that resurrection is into God's kingdom in heaven, Colossians 1 verse 5. Therefore, just because Paul mentions Jewish forefathers does not mean that Paul is relying upon the same reward as Israel is to receive in the kingdom program. Regardless of dispensation, the competent expectation, i.e., the hope, of the one trusting in God, is to be raised from the dead to receive eternal life with God. That is the promise that Paul is talking about. Therefore, when Paul says he is judged for the hope of the promise made of God, he means that he is judged for believing that God will raise him from the dead and give him eternal life. This is the same promise that the twelve tribes of Israel hope in Diana. The difference is that the body of Christ, of which Paul is a member, will have eternal life in heaven, while the twelve tribes will have eternal life on earth. 26 colon 7 Paul says that the 12 tribes are instantly serving God day and night 26 colon 7 since the dispensation of grace has been going on for at least 15 years at this point Paul must be referring to believing Israel who is standing before God's throne in heaven in other words Paul is saying that their Jewish forefathers are still waiting for God to fulfill his promise to them of eternal life by giving them a new body in the resurrection at Jesus' second coming. This means that it is not too late for those in Paul's audience also to receive the gift of eternal life from God. 26 colon 8 I love Paul's question here because the Jewish religious leaders claim to be followers of Abraham, John 8 verse 39. Abraham had to believe in resurrection in order to believe in God's promise of giving him the land, because God told Abraham that it would be at least 400 years before Israel would possess the land, and that Abraham would be in the grave before then, Genesis 15 verses 13 to 16. Therefore, if the Jewish religious leaders are truly followers of Abraham, they will not find it strange that their Messiah was resurrected from the dead. Yet, they are up in arms over it wanting to kill the Messiah's messenger, Paul. If they were Abraham's children, they would have believed the gospel, instead of trying to stop it from spreading. 26, 9-11, Paul readily admits that he killed many saints before he was saved. Yet, the Jewish leaders have no concern for these people because they were the ones who wanted him to kill them. Note the tactics he used. He would go to the synagogue, punish them, 
compel them to blaspheme, and track them down and persecute them in other cities. These are the same tactics that will be used by apostate Israel during the tribulation period. Many believers will be slain for the word of God, and for the testimony which they held, Revelation 6 verse 9. This will start when the Antichrist institutes capital punishment in the middle of the tribulation period for those not worshipping the image of the beast, Revelation 13 verse 15. That is why Jesus told his disciples that, when they see the image of the beast, the abomination of desolation, set up in the temple, they are to flee into the mountains, Matthew 24 verse 16. Just like Paul got his authority from the chief priests to kill saints, it will be the Jewish religious leaders under the Antichrist in the tribulation period who will give the authorization to capture and kill tribulation saints. When Paul says that he compelled them to blaspheme, 26, 11, he means that he got them to speak something contrary to Jewish traditions. Given the context, this probably means that he got them to admit that they believe that Jesus is the Messiah. A similar confession will be punishable by death under the Antichrist as well. This shows us that, if the Lord Jesus Christ had not interrupted Israel's program with the dispensation of grace, Paul was well on his way to being the Antichrist. Instead, he repented, and God saved him. 26, 13 I think most people do not realize just how bright God's holiness is. They know that Paul saw a light from heaven, but they probably do not think of the fact that that light did not shine in the middle of the night. Rather, the sun was brightly shining at the time which means that the brightness of God's holiness must be unfathomable, since it overpowered a bright sun. The sun is so bright that you can be permanently blinded if you stare at it for just a short period of time. Yet, the light that Paul saw was even brighter than that. It is no wonder, then, that no man hath seen God, John 1 verse 18 and 1 John 4 verse 12, and God told Moses that thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me, and live, Exodus 33 verse 20. The reason is, because the eyes are the only exposed internal organs on your body. As such, they take things into your soul. If God's holiness is taken into an unholy soul, God's holiness would be corrupted unless man's sin is dealt with by the punishment of death, Romans 6 verse 23. Thus, Jesus is the light which no man can approach unto, 1 Timothy 6 verse 16. 26, 14, God's holiness brings fallen man to his knees. By contrast, believers can come boldly unto the throne of grace, Hebrews 4 verse 16. With regard to kicking against the pricks, God had separated Paul from his mother's womb and called him by his grace to preach Jesus Christ among the heathen, Galatians 1 verses 15 to 16. As such, he was God's beast of burden, so to speak. Up until Acts 9 verse 5, Paul had rebelled against God the whole time. The pricks were things that kept the beast of burden in line. If the beast kicked against them, he was pricked. Therefore, what Jesus was saying to Paul was that he had called Paul, as the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11 verse 13, to serve him, and Paul's heart kept getting pricked by God because he knew the truth but rebelled against it. 26, 15 Paul's knowing the truth is seen in that he called Jesus Lord immediately. He knew the Old Testament well enough to know that Jesus fulfilled Old Testament prophecies to be Israel's Messiah and Lord. Yet, he rebelled against God. Now, that God has called him out on the carpet, Paul asks the Lord who he is. His expectation is confirmed when the Lord identifies himself as Jesus. 26, 16 I love how Jesus tells Paul to rise and stand upon thy feet. When people claim to have seen an appearance of the Virgin Mary, thousands of people flock to the sight to get the same religious experience, even though it was not of God. When Paul does see this great light and hear God himself speaking to him, God tells him to go and preach for him. In other words, God is not interested in people wallowing in the emotions of a great, religious experience. God wants people saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. Therefore, when a light really does shine from heaven and God really does speak from heaven, 
believing man's response is to go from there and share the gospel. It is not to flock to the sight of the experience, because God wants to save souls, not satisfy the flesh. Note that Christ promises to appear to Paul later and reveal things to him. Paul records Jesus first appearing unto him in Galatians 1 verse 17, when Jesus had him go to Arabia to be instructed in the mystery program that God had kept secret since the beginning of time, Ephesians 3 verses 4 to 5. Later on, Paul says that he was caught up into the third heaven to receive more advanced, mystery doctrine, 2 Corinthians 12 verses 2 to 4. Thus, God reveals the mystery to Paul in stages. 26 17 God delivered Paul from unbelieving Israel. This would be the people in this verse. He also delivered Paul from the Gentiles in the sense that he would not follow the pagan practices of the Gentiles, but he would follow God and his word. Since he is the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11 verse 13, he actually goes to the Gentiles with the gospel, even though, spiritually speaking, he has been delivered from them. 26 colon 18 When referring to time past for the Gentiles, Paul says that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. 1727 the Gentiles had to feel after God in time past, because they did not have the light of God's word. However, with the dispensation of grace, God told Paul that he was sending him to the Gentiles to turn them from darkness to light. In other words, the light is coming to them, rather than them having to feel after the light themselves. God was also sending Paul to the Jews, as God says. In 26 colon 17 that he sends Paul to the people and the Gentiles. The people would be unsaved Jews. With the setting aside of the kingdom program, God had declared that both Jews and Gentiles are all under sin, Romans 3 verse 9. As such, the whole world is guilty before God, Romans 3 verse 19. Therefore, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile in the dispensation of grace, Romans 10 verse 12, which means that the things mentioned in 26 colon 18 apply to both Jews and Gentiles. Although all the world is now guilty before God, all the world can be saved by God. By having faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, both Jew and Gentile can go from darkness to light and from Satan's kingdom to God's kingdom to receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance in Christ. 26 colon 20 Paul's preaching in Damascus is recorded in 9 colon 19 23. He preached the mystery there for at least three years, since the many days of 9 23 represents three years. See Galatians 1 colon 17 18 and 1 Kings 2 verses 38 to 39. Then, he preached in Jerusalem, as recorded in 9 colon 28 29. Then, 9, 30-31 records Paul preaching to the rest of Judea. Then, his going to the Gentiles is recorded beginning in Acts 13. Thus, Paul is summing up his entire ministry in one sentence. Paul showing them to repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance may sound like the kingdom gospel minus water baptism. After all, John the Baptist told Israel to repent, Matthew 3 verse 2 and bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance, Matthew 3 verse 8. However, Paul is giving the gospel of grace. The key difference is that Paul says to turn to God. The word repent means to change your mind, as seen in Numbers 23 19. It does not mean to turn from your sins and turn to God, as Christianity would have you believe. That is because we are incapable of turning away from our sins ourselves, because in our flesh dwelleth no good thing, Romans 7 verse 18. Therefore, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5 verse 8. Therefore, Paul was telling people to change their mind about trusting in their own righteousness to save them, i.e., the law, their good deeds, etc., and trust in God's imputed righteousness to give them eternal life. If they did this, the body of sin would be buried with Christ, and they would turn to God. They would then be empowered by the Holy Spirit to enable them to do works meet for repentance. Note that the grammar shows two independent things going on. Repent and turn to God is one action. 
When they repent, they would believe the gospel of grace, and they would be turned to God by the Holy Spirit, baptizing them into Christ's death. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13 and Romans 6 verses 3 to 4, and spiritually circumcising them, Colossians 2 verse 11. They would then be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do the second action, which is works meet for repentance. These are the works of faith that are fitting for someone who has repented. Thus, they are not connected to salvation, but are the result of their salvation. Thus, Paul preached salvation plus sanctification, just like God told him to do in 26, 18, where we were told that he preached so that people may receive forgiveness of sins, salvation, and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. In the case of John, the Baptist, he told the Pharisees to bring forth fruits meet for repentance, meaning that, if they believed the gospel of the kingdom, they would have come to him without their fancy robes and phylacteries. This would have demonstrated that they had changed their minds, repented, and could now be water baptized to become part of the believing remnant of Israel. This would be them being justified by faith, plus the works of faith, James 2 verse 24, while, today, we are justified by faith alone, Romans 3 verse 28. Instead, the Jewish religious leaders came to try to get people away from John and to try to stop John's ministry. Thus, John rebuked them. 26, 21 Since Festus is looking for the charges against Paul that have resulted in his appeal to Caesar, Paul is happy to provide those to him. Paul is going to be tried by the highest court in the world because he obeyed the heavenly vision from God to preach a message of salvation and sanctification to the world. How dare he do such a thing? 26, 22-23 These verses are also used by those not rightly dividing the word of truth to argue that Paul preached the same gospel message as did the twelve apostles. However, that is not true. Romans 16 verses 25 to 26 says that Paul's gospel is the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. Peter, and others preaching the kingdom gospel, preached Jesus Christ, also, but their preaching was according to what all of God's holy prophets had spoken since the world began, 3 21 While Paul preached of Jesus Christ from the Old Testament, he did not preach him as Peter preached Jesus Christ. Peter preached Jesus Christ as the one Israel had slain by wicked hands, 2.23, who was now sitting on the throne of judgment over them, 2, 30, 36. Paul preached Jesus Christ crucified, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 23, dying for their sins, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3. Both Gospels involve showing from Old Testament scriptures how the Christ would suffer and rise from the dead, but the Kingdom message mentions this as bad news, Christ is raised from the dead to judge you. The Grace message preaches this as good news, Christ is raised from the dead to save you. The reason it was important for Paul to show Jesus Christ from Old Testament scripture was because the Jews had the belief that their Christ would come to overthrow the Romans and set up God's kingdom on earth right then. Christ will still overthrow man's government and set up God's government on earth, as Daniel 2 verse 44 states. However, he will do this at his second coming, not at his first coming, because at his first coming, he came to die for Israel's sins, Matthew 20 verse 28. Finally, this verse mentions that Christ would shew light unto the people and to the Gentiles. The Jews had the light of God in his word, but they forsook it for their own traditions. Therefore, Christ had to shew light to the Jews, which Isaiah 42 verse 6 said the Messiah would do, and Luke 2 verse 32 quotes the passage to show that Jesus would fulfill that prophecy for Israel. If they then accepted that light, they would go out to the Gentiles as a kingdom of priests with the gospel of the kingdom, Exodus 19 verses 5 to 6, which they will still do during the millennial reign. Since they refused to believe, God revealed to Paul a different aspect of God's plan. That is, that Jesus Christ would be a light to the Jews and to the Gentiles through the new dispensation of grace. The Acts 2 dispensationalist will say, you are making this way too complicated by creating something that is not there. 
However, you have to remember that God kept the mystery a secret. If he had revealed it beforehand, Satan's forces would not have had Jesus crucified, 1 Corinthians 2 verses 7 to 8. So, God revealed his prophecy plan in the Old Testament and had Satan. Think that God was not going to reconcile heavenly places back to himself. He would then not be thinking of heavenly places, would have Jesus crucified, and God would reconcile both earthly and heavenly places back to himself through the cross of Christ. He then revealed to Paul how this Isaiah 42 verse 6 passage applies to the mystery dispensation, and not just to the prophecy dispensation. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, and his ways past finding out. Romans 11 verse 33. 26 colon 24 Much learning of the wisdom of this world does make someone mad. It made the Jews kill their Messiah and kill saints afterward who believed in the Messiah. Much learning of the wisdom of God, however, makes one wise, and rises them above the foolishness of the world. This is what happened with Paul. Festus, on the other hand, being wise in the wisdom of the world, thinks Paul is the one who is crazy. The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 19. That is what has happened to Festus. Note that Agrippa did not speak up. That is because Agrippa is an expert in customs and questions among the Jews, 26, 3. Granted, he does not believe yet, but he does know that there is truth in what Paul says. In other words, he knows that Paul is not mad, as Festus has claimed. 26, 25, we often think of soberness as not being drunk with alcohol. However, Paul uses the word to refer to using the mind of Christ in your thinking. In Ephesians 5 verse 18, Paul contrasts being drunk with alcohol with being filled with the Spirit. Here, then, when Paul says he speaks forth the words of truth and soberness, he means that he is speaking the truth of God's word and conveying the specific truths that God would have him use so that his audience may be saved. 26, 26-27 Paul is the one on trial, but he is not concerned with defending his innocence. Rather, his only goal is to present the gospel so that people might be saved. Therefore, he asks Agrippa if he believes the prophets. Paul said that Agrippa is an expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews, 26, 3. Therefore, he knows the prophets. He also saw all the events that went on surrounding Jesus. Therefore, he just needed a sober-minded person, like Paul, to connect the two to show him that Jesus is the Messiah. Prophesied in the Old Testament. Now, the question is, Will he abandon his self-righteousness in favor of believing the prophets? His response, in 26, 28, shows that he chose not to believe. Similarly, today, there are many people who have gone to church and know the Bible, but very few of them actually believe the Bible. 26, 29 Most Christians take Agrippa's response in 26, 28 to be sarcastic in nature, as if he said, do you really expect me to become a Christian? You are crazy. In fact, the NIV and the NLT perversions change Agrippa's statement to reflect this by saying something like, Do you think I would become a Christian so quickly? This shows fundamental Christianity's belief that becoming a Christian involves a lifelong commitment to work for Christ. Pastors will even say things like this from the pulpit, you need to count the cost before you decide to become a Christian, because it is not easy. That statement is utterly false. Becoming a Christian is one of the easiest things you could possibly do. All you have to do is recognize you are a sinner and trust in Jesus. Death, burial, and resurrection to save you. There is no work in that for you because Christ did it all. Ephesians 2 verses 8-9 Granted, being led by the Holy Spirit after you are saved is not easy, but that has nothing to do with becoming a Christian. Getting back to Agrippa's statement, we know that his statement is sincere for at least three reasons. 1. It ends in a period, which means it is a statement of fact. We know that it ends in a period because God's holy, 
Preserved word, the King James Version, ends his statement in a period. 2. Since we cannot tell tone in scripture, God would have to tell us it was a sarcastic statement for us to know. Since he does not say this, it must be a sincere statement. And 3. Paul's response shows Agrippa made a sincere statement. Paul picks up on Agrippa's word almost, and says that he wishes that all were both almost, and altogether Christians, 26, 29. In other words, Agrippa carefully considered what Paul said, compared it to what he knew about the Messiah from Old Testament scripture, and concluded that Paul may be right. We are not told, but I believe it is safe to assume that Paul made such an impact on Agrippa that he researched the matter further on his own. We will not know, until we get to heaven, whether or not Agrippa actually believed. However, the fact that Agrippa almost became a Christian with just a short testimony from Paul shows that Paul is not beside himself and crazy, as Festus alleged, 26, 24. It shows the power of the gospel to penetrate the heart and cause people to believe God. Agrippa's trouble was probably that he realized the ramifications of such a conversion, namely, that his being a king would have ended in short order. Would to God that all, who hear the gospel, would count the loss of all things as dung, that they may win Christ, Philippians 3 verse 8. Then, they would be such as I am, as Paul states in 26, 29. So, what state was Paul in? He was blessed with all spiritual blessings, Ephesians 1 verse 3, adopted as a child of God, Ephesians 1 verse 5, accepted in Christ, Ephesians 1 verse 6, redeemed and forgiven of all his sins, Ephesians 1 verse 7, given wisdom of God, Ephesians 1 verses 8 to 9, obtained an inheritance from God, Ephesians 1 verse 11, and sealed with the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 1 verse 13, and that is all just because he believed the gospel. There is even more to add when you count his service for Christ. Moreover, he will experience the exceeding riches of God's grace in the ages to come, Ephesians 2 verse 7. God's salvation deal is obviously much better than even being a king on this earth, as Agrippa was, yet most people refuse to believe this is true, because they walk by sight, and not by faith. We should also note that, the fact that Agrippa used the term Christian, shows that, by this time, it was a popular label, to use for non-believers, to categorize believers. 26, 31-32, having been confronted by the gospel, Agrippa quickly changes the focus from himself to Paul. Agrippa pities Paul, saying that Paul would be a free man if he did not appeal to Caesar. However, Agrippa is the one to be pitted, since his almost becoming a Christian means that he almost made it into heaven. His status of almost causes him to miss out on everything that Paul has. Compared with spiritual blessings, being a free man on this earth is nothing. In fact, Paul does not want to be a free man, because he still has work to do in preaching the gospel and edifying the saints in Rome, and his appeal to Caesar will keep him in Rome. Agrippa and Festus have finally figured out why Paul was beaten and almost killed by the Jews, and their judgment is that he should go free. However, it is too late to free Paul since he has appealed to Caesar. Agrippa thinks that Paul's appeal kept him from being freed, but it actually kept him from being killed by the Jews. After all, they almost killed him in Jerusalem if the Roman government had not interfered. 21, 30-32 now, if Paul goes back there, he will either be killed on the way to Jerusalem, 25, 2-3, or the Jews will kill him while there, since they will probably be more discreet, so as not to get in trouble with the Roman government. So, Agrippa's statement is incorrect. Instead, Paul gets the blessing of continuing to preach the gospel in Rome, and we will see the book of Acts conclude with him preaching the gospel in his own house for two years with no man forbidding him to do so. 28, 30, 31. That is a much better deal than going to Jerusalem to be killed. 27 Acts is written to Israel. God set aside Israel's kingdom program at the end of Acts 7 due to Israel's unbelief. He then offered them salvation again through the gospel of grace. Acts 928 records the diminishing away of Israel. In Acts 28, 
they will reject the gospel of grace for the final time, and the book ends with Jews not being a part of God's earthly kingdom or his heavenly kingdom. However, all is not lost. After the rapture of the body of Christ, God will resume Israel's kingdom program, and so all Israel shall be saved. Romans 11 verse 26. The events of Acts 27 actually happened, but the details are given, not so that we are told a nice, little story, but so that Israel may know that all is not lost for them. As such, Acts 27 tells of Israel's salvation at the end of the tribulation period through the events that take place with Paul and those with him. The sea is a picture of Satan's realm. Because Israel is in a state of unbelief, they will have strayed far away from salvation in the dispensation of grace, as pictured in verses 4 to 9 with the indirect route they are taking and how they are sailing in Satan's realm for many days, b7, with much time, spent, b9, following Satan rather than believing the gospel. God warns Israel that they will lose their lives if they do not believe the gospel, v10, but Israel chooses to listen to man, rather than to God, v11. And so, Israel keeps sailing in Satan's realm, v12, and misses the rapture. Now, they are in the tribulation period, and everything seems to be okay at first. A nice wind is blowing, and they think they have obtained their purpose, v13. This is in the early stages of the tribulation period, when the Antichrist brings Israel to power, and Israel thinks they have obtained their purpose of ruling with God in his earthly kingdom. But then, in the middle of the tribulation period, the Antichrist sets up the abomination of desolation in the temple, v14, and Israel cannot bear up in the Antichrist's rule. In other words, they cannot overpower him now that they see who he really is, so, they let her drive, v15, meaning that the Antichrist rules for the whole tribulation period. Israel then trusts in her own self-righteousness to make it into God's kingdom, as shown by the much work they did and the helps they used to undergird the ship, but their own righteousness is like quicksand, v16-17. Then, Israel sees that her own self-righteousness will not bring her into God's kingdom, so, she begins casting off the cares of this world, verses 18-19. Note how they toss things out of the ship for three days, verses 18 to 19, which is a type of how Jesus Christ was in the belly of the earth for three days, Matthew 12 verse 40, tossing aside the weight of sin for Israel that so easily besets them, Hebrews 12 verse 1. The many days of no sun or stars is a type of Israel going through the night of the tribulation period, Psalm 30 verse 5. After many days of still being tossed to and fro by Satan, Israel gives up hope that they will ever enter God's kingdom, v20. That is when, after long abstinence, the word of God is found, 2 Kings 22 verse 8, and they find that God's word to Israel says that all Israel shall be saved, Romans 11 verse 26, even if all their worldly possessions are lost, verses 21 to 24. God hath given thee all of them that sail with thee, v24 refers to all who believe the gospel of the kingdom. This is the Israel of God, Galatians 6 verse 16. In order to be saved, Israel will have to abandon the Antichrist and believe God's word, which will cast them upon a spiritual island, v. 26. God will feed them there for the last three 12 years of the tribulation period, Revelation 12 verse 6. Because tribulation will be so great, it will seem like they are waiting forever for their salvation to come from the Lord. They will cast anchor in God's word and wish for the day of the Lord's appearing, v. 29. The shipment of verse 30 represent the Gentiles who believe in God's word going through the tribulation period. Toward the end of the tribulation period, they are about to abandon God, which is when God will give the warning that they must believe in the gospel in order to be saved, verses 30-31 as we see an angel proclaiming to the Gentiles in Revelation 14 verses 6 to 7. Note how Paul says in verse 31 that except these abide in the ship, why ye cannot be saved, showing that salvation comes to the Gentiles through Israel in Israel's program during the millennial reign. This is seen in Mark 7:27. but Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled, 
for it is not meet to take the children's bread, and to cast it unto the dogs. Some Gentiles will abandon the Antichrist, cutting off his program, in order to trust in God's program. V32. The day was coming on. Shows that the Antichrist and his kingdom have been overthrown at the end of the tribulation period, meaning that Jesus' second coming is at hand. V33. They then need to take on the meat of God's word so that they have faith in God to save them at his second coming. V33. Otherwise, they will not be saved. Matthew 24 verse 13. If they do take in God's word, meat, they will not even lose a hair. V34. This should remind us of the three Hebrew boys who went through the fiery furnace without losing a hair. Daniel 3 verse 27. As a sign of going through the fiery tribulation and scathed. Which is also why Jesus told saved Israel that the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Matthew 10 verse 30. Verse 33 tells us that they are on day 14 without taking in God's word, v. 33. It appears that there are 45 days of darkness between the Antichrist's kingdom being overthrown and Jesus' second coming. The difference between the 1,335 days and the 1,290 days of Daniel 12 verses 11 to 12. Paul's taking bread, giving thanks, and giving it to those there, v. 35 should remind us of Jesus' feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000, Matthew 14 verse 19 and 15 36, respectively, which are types of how those knowing the gospel of the kingdom will feed those who need to go back to that gospel message, as symbolized by the five virgins with oil in their lamps who had to trim their lamps in Jesus' parable in Matthew 25 verses 4 to 7. In other words, they cast out the cares of this world in order to be saved, as symbolized by casting wheat into the sea in. Verse 38. The saved, at the end of the tribulation period, take in the spiritual food of the word of God so that they can continue to endure unto the end, as they wait for Jesus' second coming, while the world tries to toss them out of believing in God's salvation. And when it was day, they knew not the land. V. 39 shows how it takes the Lord Jesus Christ to bring them into God's kingdom. The certain creek, V39, they discover is a type of the river of life. Following that river leads to God's throne in the kingdom, Revelation 22 verse 1. Romans 11 verse 26 says, And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Shem the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. That is what we see in verses 42 to 44. Verse 42 shows how Satan wants to kill saved Israel, but Jesus Christ steps in, represented by the centurion in verse 43, so that they escaped all safe to land, v. 44. Therefore, Israel is in a status of unbelief in both the kingdom program in early Acts and the mystery program in the rest of Acts. However, they will still make it safely into God's kingdom by enduring unto the end of the tribulation period. Chapter 27 27 colon 1 And when it was determined tells us that Paul was sitting around in Caesarea for a good while after chapter 26, before they finally shipped him to Rome. The we of this verse tells us that Luke is also one of the prisoners being taken to Rome. Luke puts all of the attention on Paul, because he is the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11 verse 13. Christians accuse right dividers of putting too much focus on Paul. However, since the Holy Spirit, through the pen of Luke, chose to write about Paul and not really talk about other saints with him, should we not follow the Holy Spirit's lead and focus on Paul, as well? 27 colon 2, the focus has been on Paul his beating by the Jews, and the trials that he went through. However, now we find out that Aristarchus probably went through similar things that Paul went through. Aristarchus is one of Paul's right-hand men and has also suffered many things for the cause of Christ. In 1929, we are told he was one of Paul's companions in travel and that he was persecuted by the Ephesians when they could not find Paul. 20 colon 4 says that he went to Asia with Paul. He must have traveled to Jerusalem with Paul, and went through many of the things that Paul went through, because he is now going with Paul to Rome as a prisoner. This makes Aristarchus one of the unsung heroes of the faith. The same goes for Luke, being there also. 
This shows that Paul had a few saints with him the whole time from his beating and arrest in Jerusalem to his journey to Rome. When you get to heaven, there will probably be a big crowd around Paul, so, why not go to Aristarchus instead and hear similar stories from him? 27, 3 Paul is a Roman citizen, which means he is not to be treated badly, as long as he has not been found guilty of a crime, 22-29. Therefore, Paul is getting a free trip to Rome, and he is able to visit the churches at stops along the way. What a blessing that the government is footing the bill for this apostolic journey. 27,4-8 Satan knows that Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11 verse 13, who has done much harm to his kingdom, is on the ship. Therefore, Satan tries to kill Paul through bad weather. This is sort of the opposite of Jonah's situation. Jonah was tossed on a ship in a big storm by God because he had disobeyed God. Paul was tossed on a ship by Satan because he was doing God's will. However, this is nothing new for Paul, as Paul has already been shipwrecked three times before, including spending 24 hours in the ocean, waiting for rescue, 2 Corinthians 11 verse 25. In trying to kill Paul, though, Satan actually plays right into God's hand, as they had to sail a more indirect route, sailing slowly, and going through more cities. This probably gave Paul the opportunity to witness to at least some people at each dock. It definitely gave Paul the chance to be joyful during the tumult, which is an excellent testimony to the unsaved prisoners and the guards on the ship with him. Similarly, today, when we face trials and tribulations, rather than getting us down, we should have rejoice evermore, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 16, so that others may see and believe the gospel as a result. 27, 9, the fast refers to the Day of Atonement, which was an annual fast day for Israel, Leviticus 23 verses 26 to 32. Since the book of Acts was written to Israel, Luke uses the fast as a time marker, so that the Jews would immediately recognize the time of the year and know that it was a dangerous time in which to be sailing. 27, 10, Paul has been shipwrecked on at least three previous occasions. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 25. Therefore, Paul is experienced enough to know that much damage will happen if they continue sailing, including people being hurt or killed. Paul knows that he will not be killed, because Jesus said he would witness for him in Rome, 2311. However, others may be killed. If they have not believed the gospel, they will not have eternal life. Therefore, Paul, concerned for their souls, warns them not to continue sailing. 27, 11, Paul is more in tune with what is going on than the experts are. Similarly, a Bible believer is more in tune with the gospel and the knowledge of the truth than the experts, who are seminary graduates. 27, 14, evidentially, these storms were so bad that they had invented their own terms to describe them. 27, 18, 20, Paul told them not to sail but they sailed anyway. The result is that all of their goods have been taken away from them, and that they are certain that they will die. All hope that we should be saved was then taken away. 27, 20. This is a type of how man, in his pride, will not believe the gospel until he realizes that he has no hope to save himself. 27, 22-24, before, Paul said that he thought that people would be killed if they continued sailing, 27, colon 10. Now that all hope is lost, he gets the official word from God that all will be spared. Their ship and goods will all perish, but all of the people on the ship will be saved. However, they have to believe the word of God spoken by Paul. If they do not believe, they will jump ship and be lost. The only way man can be saved if he trusts in God, and not in the treasures of this world. 27, colon 25, I believe God. Paul sets the example for the rest of the people on the ship. Similarly, Christians today need to take a stand on God's word and believe it, regardless of what man says. Then, others may believe and be saved, as well. 27,31-32 They did not listen to Paul before when he told them to stop sailing. 27,10 
Now, he makes an unusual statement that the centurion and the soldiers will not be saved if the shipmen flee. Why should this make any difference? However, the centurion now believes Paul, probably because they have not died yet. Therefore, the centurion obeys Paul and keeps the shipmen in the boat. 27, 33, not only do they believe Paul because he has been right so far, but they also believe him because they are still alive, even though they have not eaten for 14 days. 27, 36, they are still on the ship, waiting to be rescued. Yet, they are all of good cheer. 27, 36, why? Because they believe the word that Paul has given to them, and, because they believe, they will be saved. Similarly, even after Babylon falls after the end of the tribulation period, all believers will be of good cheer, because they know that Jesus Christ will bring them safely into the kingdom. 27, 37, 276 souls were saved. This number must be significant or else we would not be told it. 276 is 12 times 23. 12 is the number of the tribes of Israel. 23 means that God is with them, as seen by God with us being found in Matthew 1 verse 23, and the Lord being Israel's shepherd in Psalm 23, among other scriptural support. It is significant that the numbering of the Levitical priests came out to be 23,000, Numbers 26, 62, because Israel will be a kingdom of priests to the Gentiles in the Millennial Kingdom, Exodus 19 verses 5 to 6, and it is Zechariah 8 verse 23 that talks of how the Gentiles will be saved by going with the Jews to Jerusalem. Therefore, the 276 souls are a reference to how God is with His people for all eternity in Israel's program, and His people include both Jews and Gentiles. Chapter 28 28. The Miletians respond to God's word based on feelings, verses 1 to 10. Then, Paul makes it to Rome, v. 16, and preaches to the Jews there, verses 17 to 24. However, they do not believe. Therefore, his ministry to the Jews is over. He will now go only to Gentiles, v. 28, which is why the book of Acts ends. We will now go on to Romans through Philemon, where believers learn sound doctrine. For today's dispensation of grace, 28, 1-10 This story represents how people typically respond to the truth of God's word based on their feelings, rather than on an objective look at what you present to see if it is true or not. Therefore, if they have any faith, it is placed in a person, rather than in the word of God, which means that even the faithful are not saved. This shows how most People who attend Christian churches today will not make it into heaven. 28, colon 1 Melita means sweet honey, which is a type of how the promised land is a land flowing with milk and honey. Exodus 3 verses 8 and 17, 13, colon 5, 33, colon 3, Jeremiah 11, colon 5, 32, colon 22, and Ezekiel 20 verses 6 and 15. 28, colon 2, the barbarous people help out Paul and the others. Such help is often called showing Christian love by Christians. However, the barbarous people were just superstitious people. This shows that what man labels as Christian love is really just the human good side of man. Christian love is judging all to be dead in their trespasses and sins. Ephesians 2 verse 1 and 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14 and allowing sound doctrine for today to work through you so that others may be saved. 28, 3-4 for unbelievers use the wisdom of this world, which the Bible describes as earthly, sensual, devilish, James 3 verse 15. The barbarians use this wisdom to determine that the God of vengeance is killing Paul for being a murderer. They have no doubt that is what has happened, 28, 4. Yet, once Paul shakes off the viper, they will conclude that Paul is a god, 28, 6. This shows how man's wisdom is based on what he sees, and his response is based upon his emotions, rather than on truth. 28, 5 Paul's being bit by a deadly snake, but having no harm come to him shows that physical miracles are still happening. I Corinthians 13, 10 says, But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. 
The context shows this verse means that, when the mystery program is fully revealed in God's written word, there will be no more need for physical miracles. Ephesians 1 verse 8 indicates that all wisdom and prudence have now been revealed to us today. However, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians were not written until after Acts 28. Therefore, until the end of the book of Acts, physical miracles were still happening to provoke Israel to jealousy so that they might be saved. Romans 11 verse 11. This snake-biting Paul does not fulfill Mark 16 verse 18, where Jesus said, They shall take up serpents, because the context of Mark 16 is Israel going out to the Gentiles with the gospel in the kingdom program. However, what happens to Paul does tell us what Jesus meant when he said, They shall take up serpents. That is, he meant it as a physical sign of how Satan's attacks cannot harm the believing remnant of Israel. He did not mean it as a prideful display of God's so-called presence, as snake-handling churches misuse the passage today. However, Paul's survival of the snake bite is still a physical sign of how believers today can be unharmed by Satan, the spiritual serpent, Genesis 3 verse 1 and Revelation 12 verse 9, when they use the armor of God against him, Ephesians 6 verses 11 to 18. 28 colon 6 within a matter of minutes, these barbarians go from thinking that Paul is a murderer to thinking that he is a god. Spiritual truths are based on faith, not on sight. Hebrews 11 verses 1 to 6. Therefore, if you rely upon sight to determine your beliefs, they can be wrong, as shown here. They were wrong at first about the god of vengeance punishing Paul for being a murderer, and now they are wrong about Paul being a god because he did not die. But, because their spirits are dead in their trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2 verse 1, these barbarians can only rely upon sight. This is an important lesson for Christians to learn. Because unbelievers are looking at our actions, we need to be walking by faith. Most Christians live in the flesh. If they continue to do evil things, as unbelievers do, the world will conclude they are bad people who need the crutch of religion just to function normally in society. If they do good things in their flesh, unbelievers will see them as hypocrites, because the unbelievers can tell that their behavior is really no better than the unbelievers' behavior. The difference is the few good deeds they do, which is displayed with a prideful, uppity attitude. Therefore, regardless of what Christians do I end the energies of their flesh, unbelievers will not be drawn to Christ. However, if we recognize that the old man is crucified with Christ, Romans 6 verse 6, and we allow Christ to live in us by believing God's word rightly divided, allowing the sound doctrine of Paul's epistles to work through us, then the excellency of the power may be of God, and not of us, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7. Then, unbelievers may become believers. To repent means to change your mind. These barbarians change their minds here. However, they only changed their minds about Paul. They did not believe the gospel. Since God uses repent as part of the gospel, that is probably why the word repent is not used here. 28, 8-10 Many people are healed of diseases, but they honor Paul, rather than believing the gospel and being saved. Therefore, the physical healings did no good, since they did not result in spiritual healings. Timewise, this is the last recorded instance of physical healings, and it shows why God did not continue the physical healings. Since all people live forever, whether in the lake of fire or in God's kingdom, God is not concerned about lengthening people's physical lives. He is only concerned with their spiritual well-being. 1 Timothy 2 verse 4 Since physical healings are not resulting in people being saved, there is no need to continue the physical healings after the book of Acts. 28, 11-14 Paul is not on an official, apostolic journey. Rather, he is a prisoner and was with 275 other people who were on a ship, 27, 37, comprised of prisoners and guards, 27, 1. However, Paul has shown that God is speaking through him, and God has saved their lives. Therefore, at this point, it appears that the Roman centurion is willing to let Paul do what he wants to, as seen by them staying with brethren in Putili for seven days, 28, 
as if Paul is on another apostolic journey. 28,15 Note how Paul thanked God and took courage when he saw some brethren. When compared with the world, believers are always in the minority. It can be discouraging to know that very few people believe the truth like you do. Therefore, when Paul sees brethren who want the truth so much that they travel to meet his ship, he is encouraged. We see another example of this in 2 Corinthians 7 verses 6 to 7, when Paul is comforted in knowing that the Corinthians have had a godly sorrow that resulted in their repentance. The world may take comfort in riches and peace, but someone, being led by the Holy Spirit, is comforted by the God of all comfort. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 3, when they see members of the body of Christ diligently seeking and applying the truth of God's word rightly divided. Hebrews 11 verse 6. 28 colon 16 Paul may still be a prisoner, but the centurion recognizes that they would have been killed if not for Paul. Therefore, he gets his own room in Rome. 28 colon 17 Paul had appealed to Caesar and must have been waiting trial by Caesar. However, Jesus said that Paul would testify of Christ in Rome, 2311. Therefore, Paul gets to work. Rather than waiting quietly for his trial, Paul uses his freedom to call the Jewish leaders together. 28, 19 Paul was almost killed by the Jews, 2131, being falsely accused of teaching against the Jewish temple and the Jewish law and of profaning the temple with Gentiles, 2128. The Jews then told the Romans to kill him, 2222. The Jewish high priest commanded that he be slapped on the mouth, 23,2-3. More than 40 Jews vowed not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul, 23,12-13. They falsely accused him again in a Roman court, 24,5-9. He remained bound for two years, thanks to the Jews, 2400 hours 27. The Jews again tried to kill him, 25,2-3. He had to appeal to Caesar to keep from getting killed, 25,11, which resulted in many months on a turbulent sea, 27. Yet, in spite of all of this, Paul makes the statement, not that I had ought to accuse my nation of, 28,19. Paul can make that statement because he recognizes that the Jews are just like he was before he was saved. That is, they are dead in their trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2 verse 1, and are just acting out of their flesh. Therefore, he could wish himself accursed from Christ so that Israel might be saved, Romans 9 verses 3 to 4. Only by the love of God being shed abroad in his heart, Romans 5 verse 5, could he not even have an inkling of revenge in his heart and want Israel to be saved at all costs. 28 colon 20 for this cause then, tells us that, the reason he has called the Jews together, is so they do not think, that he is mad at them and wants revenge. He then uses this gathering as an opportunity to give them the gospel by saying that he is bound for the hope of Israel. This does not mean God's earthly kingdom for the nation of Israel, since Paul preached the gospel of grace, which involves a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1. There are only two other references to the hope of Israel in the Bible, and they both refer to the Lord Jesus Christ, see Jeremiah 14 verse 8 and 17 13. Therefore, what Paul is saying is that he is bound because he is hoping in the Lord Jesus Christ to give him eternal life. That hope, at the time Paul was preaching, would only come to Israel if they trusted in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for sin. 28, 21 The Jewish religious leaders in Jerusalem probably did not pursue Paul to Italy because it is so far away from Jerusalem, as evidenced by the long journey there. They probably figure that Paul will never make it back to Jerusalem, so, he is out of their hair. Also, 18, 3 tells us that the Jews have been commanded to depart from Rome. Therefore, while there are Jews in Rome, they probably do not have any political influence over the court of Caesar, there. 28, 22 The Jewish religious leaders spoke against Christians everywhere, because Christians were taking good, tithe-paying members away from their synagogues. Note how Christianity was considered to be a sect of Judaism. 2,000 years later, 
Though, Christianity has developed its own profane rules and Judaism has gotten farther away from the Old Testament such that they are now considered to be two separate religions. 28 colon 23 Acts 2 and Acts 28 Dispensationalists see the term Kingdom of God and immediately think that Paul was preaching the same message as the Twelve Apostles preached. However, remember that he is preaching to Jews, and he says that he had been arrested for the hope of Israel, which we have already seen is the Lord Jesus Christ. Also, we have just been told that these Jews have heard a lot of bad things about Christians, 28, 22. Therefore, if Paul immediately started talking about a new dispensation and the gospel of grace, they would have rejected him. Therefore, he goes back to the law and the prophets to go over key prophecies about the Messiah to show that Jesus Christ is their Messiah. Old Testament prophecy says that the Messiah was supposed to die for the sins of Israel, while the Jews only saw their Messiah as coming to overthrow the Romans and rule the world with the Jews ruling with him. Therefore, Paul had to get the Jewish religion out of their minds and replace it with sound doctrine from the Old Testament before they could see that Jesus is their Messiah. With that fact established, he could then tell them that salvation now comes by believing in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for their sins, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3-4, rather than by placing themselves under the Mosaic law. Unfortunately, he never gets around to the gospel because they end up rejecting Jesus as their Messiah, 28, 24-25. As far as Paul testifying of the kingdom of God is concerned, we have to realize that God's kingdom is any place where God rules, which is both heaven and earth. Even the famous Lord's Prayer says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven, Matthew 6 verse 10 which tells us that God's kingdom is in heaven. Since they were Jews, Paul spoke to them using Old Testament scripture. He then would have shared how the Jews had rejected Jesus as their Messiah, leading God to switch his focus back onto his kingdom in heaven. But, since he never got that far and Luke is writing to the Jews, he uses the more general term that he testified the kingdom of God. He did not testify of the dispensation of the grace of God, Ephesians 3 verse 2, because they rejected Jesus as their Messiah. Without that foundation established with the Jews, he could not go on to the gospel for today, because they would have rejected it. 28, 24-27 Now, you may wonder why Paul rejected the whole group of Jews, when some of them believed. There are two reasons, one, he spoke to the group, and the group as a whole did not believe, and two, the people, who believed, only believed that Jesus is the Messiah. They had not heard and believed the gospel. It is reasonable to assume that Paul shared the gospel with the believers later on, but, when he spoke to the group as a whole, he stated that Israel has rejected the truth. This is Israel's final indictment, as shown by Paul's quote of Isaiah 6 verses 9 to 10. They have physical eyes and ears, but they do not spiritually see and hear what God is telling them. They have rejected both the salvation that God offered to them under the prophecy program and the salvation that God offered to them under the mystery program. Now, that is not to say that individual Jews cannot be saved in the mystery dispensation, but it is to say that they are now in the dark when it comes to God's word, because of their closed eyes and dull off hearing ears. Note that it does not say that they are blind and deaf. It just says that they have closed their eyes and their ears are dull of hearing, which implies that they can also open their eyes and unclog their ears if they choose to do so. As such, they are like the Gentiles were in Israel's program before Acts 9. They can feel after him and find him, 1727, in their darkness and be saved. However, not many of them will do so. The evidence of this is seen in that the body of Christ has predominantly been comprised of Gentiles in the last 2000 years, and, when referring to the body of Christ, they are usually called Gentiles, see Romans 11 verses 13 and 25. As a side note, 28 colon 25 says that the Holy Ghost spake by Isaiah. It does not say that Isaiah spoke. This shows that God's word is not God giving general thoughts to people who wrote them down in their own words. Rather, 
The Holy Ghost himself spoke every single word found in scripture, which tells us that God's inspiration was a dictation of words, so that everything was conveyed exactly as God intended it to be. 28 colon 28 for the third time in the book of Acts, Paul says that the gospel of grace will not go to the Jews, but it will go to the Gentiles, who will believe it, in contrast with the Jews, who did not believe it. The first two times are found in 1346 and 18 colon 6. These three strikes represent the Jews being out of God's plan now. Granted, Jews can still be saved, but God will now focus on reaching the Gentiles with the gospel. Therefore, the book of Acts ends. People say that it ends in a weird place since it does not finish telling us the details of Paul's life. However, that is not the book's goal. The book was written to the Jews so that they might be saved. It shows the Jews rejecting the gospel of the kingdom in Acts 1-7, and the Jews rejecting the gospel of grace in Acts 9-28. The Jews stumbled at the cross, they fell in Acts 1-7, and they diminished away in Acts 9-28. Now that they have rejected God's good news completely, they are out of the picture. Therefore, the book ends, and we begin reading Romans through Philemon, which are the books of instruction for today's dispensation of grace believers, who are primarily Gentiles. 28 colon 29 The Jews' departure symbolizes their departing out of God's will, which is for them to be saved, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. As we learned in Acts 27, the Jews will be saved in the end, but not until after this current dispensation of grace ends with the rapture of the body of Christ. 28, 30-31 With the Jews out of the way, no man forbids Paul's preaching, which shows that the vast majority of Paul's persecution came from religious Jews. Again, Paul's preaching of the kingdom of God does not mean he preached the kingdom gospel. He preached the gospel of grace so that people may be saved and become part of the body of Christ, who will occupy the heavenly portion of God's kingdom. When Paul taught the things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, he taught what we find in Romans through Philemon, which the Lord Jesus Christ showed him. Namely, he taught salvation by faith in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3-4, and sanctification through the reading of God's word, Ephesians 5 verse 26, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, which allows the Holy Spirit to teach you the things of God, 1 Corinthians 2 verses 10-14, so that you can use the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16, to walk in the Spirit, Galatians 5 verse 16. These are the things we will now learn in Paul's epistles, the only portion of the Bible written directly to us today.